It's all about the apps these days. So we couldn't leave this topic out. And we have two very unique perspectives to provide you with today. I'm first going to introduce you to Dr. Robert Pachter. He's the CEO of Pilljogger, formerly Chief of Radiology at Marin General Hospital in Marin County and at Northwest Medical Center in Tucson. Pilljogger is a mobile medication adherence solution, and as we all know, medication compliance is a giant challenge in healthcare. Part two of our appification session is all about distribution and access to apps. More importantly, access to good ones. Today we have Ben Choder here, the CEO of Haptik, a mobile health application store, an app management solution that helps healthcare providers, physicians, and patients easily integrate mHealth into their treatment. I'm very anxious to hear all about this, and I think we have all, a lot to learn from them today. Thank you. Hello, good morning. I'm going to speak about a problem called adherence, and this picture pretty much tells the whole story. Who knows what the number one Medicare expense is? Anybody? Any physicians? United Health? What's the number one? CHF, congestive heart failure, the failure of the heart to pump strong enough to get blood around the body. And we, we have these uh, people in the hospital. And uh, they undergo extremely expensive tests on CAT scans and MRIs, the kind of machines I used to use in my practice. Millions of dollars are spent, billions of dollars are spent, and the treatment is medicine. Beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, diuretics, those sorts of things. So this is after the expensive hospitalization's done, this is what we send people home with. And the number one bounce back, the number one readmission is CHF. So we're doing something wrong, and in the process, we're spending billions and billions of dollars we don't have. So this, to me, was a great opportunity. If we could solve this problem, we have a, uh, something of very great value to the stakeholders in general, to the patients, of course, to pharma, to retailers, to payers. It's not just a problem in the elderly, though. All age groups are on medicine, even in the adolescent population. Diseases like diabetes, diseases like asthma, when these people get sick, it gets very expensive, and they can die. If you've ever seen a kid in the status asthmaticus, which is when you just can't break the, the very tight bronchi, the spasm of the bronchi, it's a, it's a tragic sight. So, we want to avoid these avoidable complications of disease, of chronic disease, and we can do so by just getting people to take their medicine. Now, as we get older, you can see that people are on more medicine, but even in the middle age group, in general, there's a great number of people, millions of Americans, on more than one medicine. But even when they're on just one medicine, this is a study of over 4,000 patients published, I think, in the British Medical Journal. Even when they're only one, on one medicine, some people never fill the prescription. It used to be quoted as 30% with EHRs. That number has gone down to some degree in the high teens. But still, a lot of people never fill the first prescription. And by and large, we can't help a lot of them. They're just not going to take medicine. They're not medicine takers. They go to their doctor. They get a prescription. It's not going to happen. But there's many people that we potentially can reach. And the problem is called persistence and adherence. So in persistence, you just don't go to get the prescription filled or refilled you know, when you're supposed to. In adherence, you kind of get messed up, and some days you take it, some days you don't. Some days you're late filling the prescription. All this leads to, as I pointed out, unnecessary uh, misery and healthcare costs. A very big problem, up to 100,000 Americans per year are uh, are victims of this preventable disease, basically. There's a bunch of information in the handout that I'll just allude to on the screen. Jill wanted this to be an educational uh, conference to a large degree, not just kind of a pitch, pitch session. So I, I wanted to include some information, but I won't dwell on it. We're in the smartphone game. That's why we're here at this mobile summit. We're using the power of smart mobile to reach people, to get them to take their medicine. And we've come up with some other innovations that I hope will complete that chain. Now, as we just heard, Lisa said, 
in, by and large, of all the apps that people are downloading, very few of them are in the health or medical field. And this shows the most popular apps, what people are downloading, what people are using. But this very complicated slide, I just want to point out one thing. When people actually download a health app or a medical app, and this is not necessarily an exercise app, but like a, a medical app, they tend to keep it and use it if it's of value to them. The number of apps is obviously increasing as people are adopting smartphones in order to do their daily lives. They're moving away from uh, their computers and going into, uh, uh, into the tablets and to mobile. And there's been a number of developments on the mobile front. We just heard some comments about that. Not a whole lot in the adherence side. It crosses all demographics. Again, I won't go through this busy slide. And it turns out that for certain diseases, you can reach people a little more easily than others. Like diabetics potentially are more interested in health apps. We think that if you can reach them uh, throughout the disease spectrum, even when they're healthy, with healthy behaviors, you can uh, ultimately uh, save, save them a great deal of uh, illness that's preventable. So we developed, at the beginning, just a smartphone app. Just, uh, the, the idea came to me because I wanted something for my elderly mom, so that when she saw her pills, there could be a picture from a database of the pill, similar to uh, uh, some other uh, apps or books out there that show pictures of, of medicines. We wanted to, to sync with the medical record, so that as a prescription change, it would automatically update the phone. And we needed to make it kind of pleasant, and we needed to make it rewarding. But one thing we tried to stay away from from the very beginning is this concept of gamification, which has gotten kind of old and hackneyed. It's, it has value. But really, it goes back even further than that trend to the 1950s, really, with behavioral modification and, and um, positive reinforcement. So, the grand idea that we came up with is everybody likes one thing. Any, any suggestions of what is, what is common to all ages and all races and creeds? Everybody likes and needs in this economy to save money. And that's why they join loyalty programs. So if you belong to Safeways loyalty program, you save money because as you go to the store and you buy things, whether it's in the Safeway Pharmacy or on the, on the other, the commerce side, you're potentially saving money with everything you buy. And then they can give you vouchers. And they've created personalized programs, as have other retailers. Safeways is called Just For You, because they're accumulating data on you. And we all know this. It's been talked about a great deal, how data is being acquired from all the sources, the surfing on the internet and everything else. Well. You can use that data for nefarious purposes, or you can use it to help people. And that's what we're trying to do here. Because if we can integrate the information from the various loyalty programs into our program, and offer somebody a coupon, or a rebate, or a discount, or actual cash for just coming into the store, now that interaction has value to the individual that they've already identified as something of use to them. And we didn't want to be as crass as just to say, OK, here, it's medicine time. Here's a, a coupon. We wanted to create some uh, suspense, some uh, uncertainty into the, uh, into the experience. So we, we built a game. Uh, uh, in this case, it's a virtual scratch-off. There's various games in our library under development. But the scratch-off is cool because everybody knows how to do it. Okay? It's not a, a great skill thing, but it takes a moment to see what did I actually get to. Even that wasn't enough, we found to boost adherence all the way. We have to still take another step. And the next step we took was the development of a device that actually delivers your medicine on the phone. It seemed like a, a preposterous idea at first. And the more that we got into it, the more pra practical and pragmatic and actually valuable this concept had. Because if you could package somebody's medicine into a daily cartridge, which we call MedWheel, and you put all their medicines for that day into all the dosing quadrants for that day into the wheel. And all they have to do is just open it when it's medicine time. They don't have to mess with pill bottles. They don't have to mess with pill boxes that they sort out. Then you've really made it convenient. You've taken a big barrier down to get people to take your medicine. 
And we can send a signal into the phone when they take the, uh, the pill that they've done so. So it's, a, it's a, a way of kind of recording an event that is very valuable to, say, assisted living facilities or family members that you're kind of keeping an eye on, or pharmacies have a great deal of interest in this. Are people taking their medicine, or do they need a refill? So the, the concept seemed to make sense. Then the question was, did it make economical sense to put this device on a phone? Could we produce these at a rate that made it cost effective? So there have been programs with unit dosing of medicine, blister packing of medicine. But in general, they've been very expensive because they're done at the pharmacy. But this can be done at a central facility. A number of manufacturers we talk to and wholesalers and here and, and in Europe. So that we can produce these by taking the information from the cloud about one's prescribing data and putting it on the phone. So I've gone through the story of how we um, uh, evolved, if you will, because we started with a very simple idea. How could we address adherence? And how could we use the power of mobile? And we didn't really pivot as we went along. We just continued to create more ideas that could help the problem. And that, if there's anything here, that's the take home message. The last thing we're doing is transitional care. We're moving into tablets to help people, when they get discharged from the hospital, guide themselves every day so they don't bounce back. Remember, as I started, CHF is the number one readmission diagnosis. That with pneumonia costs Medicare $17 billion. And as of October 1st, if the Supreme Court doesn't strike down in the Affordable Care Act, hospitals eat that. So they need a solution so that people don't bounce back. Well, adherence is such a large component of these readmissions, between 33 and 66 percent, somewhere in that range, depending on the study. If we have that problem licked, we can also build around a transitional care program that can show people what they need to do each day. They can tap to have a conversation with their caregiver. And they can step on a connected scale that would automatically record their weight and send this information to the transitional care team. So we've looked at the economics of this. What if we created a program on a tablet? How much, would it, how much ultimately would it cost to be break even with the number of people that are readmitted in a year. And it wasn't even close. It's a, it's a tremendous return on investment. And we said, OK, we're not going to be effective 100%. What if we're 50%? What if we're 10%? What if we're 5%? And it always works out. So the next thing is to get into trial with this program. We're moving forward with the pill jogger. And um, I'm going to stop there and give Ben a chance to talk. And then we'll answer any questions, entrepreneurs. Uh, Please, uh, again, my email is robert at pilljogger.com. Any uh, questions uh, you have, send them my way. Robert, thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Good job. Thanks. Um, before I start, it's pretty interesting. Jill told us that the audience is very diverse. What percentage of the audience like, make apps? Can you raise your hand? We'll do this old school. All right, what percentage of the audience is institutions? I'm talking like hospitals and providers, all right? And payers, do we have any payers in the audience? Great, all right, so that helps me out a lot. So aptifying, you know, it's this great term that everyone's come up with. It's, you know, aptifying, you know, everyone's big thing is let's turn our website into an app and download it. Is that really creating a, a usable engagement tool? Um, so it's a big question that I always have, you know, and is there a big opportunity for healthcare for apps that are connected and custom? I say yes. I'm going to go over a lot of information about the app world, not talk that much about Haptique, but in general what Haptique is, is we enable the curation of apps, the certification apps, and at the end of the day, it's all about the prescribing of the apps for better engagement, better adherence, better outcomes. So, you know, one of the biggest challenges out there is obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular, we hear it every day. Everyone knows what the basic areas are, and it's all about non-compliance, right? So what do they have in common? You know, they're all driven by individual behavior. So we think the persistent pr problem needs a new solution, right? We think the way it's going to come about is the providers, the hospitals, 
bringing in the physicians into the network and enabling them to engage with the patients, which we think is the total key in this. You know, mobile health is disruptive innovation, you know. mHealth has an unprecedented potential of patient empowerment and engagement. Are apps the key of the revolution? Yeah, in some cases, but it's not just about, you know, going on iTunes and looking for a glucose monitor and seeing 250 apps. It's how do we cut through the clutter? How do we make change? How do we get people to use these apps? You know, what's the game-changing shift? How do we turn the end audience, the patient, um, from a beneficiary to an active consumer? Um, and we think it's all about engagement, especially if you think about 10,000 baby boomers turning 65 every single day, and they don't want to leave their home. How do we get them connected? How do we get them to keep in touch with not only their family, but their physician? Um, you know, there's lots of facts why this industry is going to make it. You know, if you believe what research guidance said in 2011, it's 718 million, and by the end of this year, it should be somewhere about 1.2 billion. Um, I don't know if the money, and it came from the last conversation too, it's not so much about the app, but it's about how do apps help the overall? How does it help inherence? How does it help engagement? You know, big consideration as you're building apps. Who's your audience? What does the app? and do and the company created, right? And why do someone, you know, why does anyone need an app? How is it actually going to change their behavior? One of the first things that everyone should think about when you're building an app, and most app developers aren't thinking about today, is the security element of it. You know, is it HIPAA compliant? Is it, is it keeping data? Is there any malware? Is there any security breaches? You know, where is that data going and how is that data going to get back into the provider's hands? So in this case, whether it's a hospital or a physician, if the patient is staying engaged, how do we get that information? Is there, is there truly one size fits all? Or are some people going to put it into their EMR? Some people going to put it into their EHR? Some people going to put it into a health vault? How do we get that information? And how do we enable the physician to engage with the patient consistently? You know, is gamification the way to go? Well, you know, games work in certain cases. You know, if we're talking children and diabetes, it's, it's incredible. But, if, I, if I'm an adult male and I have a heart condition, I'm on a cholesterol app, is, is there any game that's going to make me take you know, my heart condition serious? I kind of think that you know, if my doctor prescribes me a cholesterol app, A, I'm more likely to adhere to my medication, and B, I don't think I need a game for me to keep on taking my Lipitor if it's going to help me stay alive. Um, and then there's two sides of the whole thing as we're thinking about building apps. There is the provider side. So institutions are building clinical apps, you know, organizations like Mount Sinai have built 37 of their own apps. 50% of those apps are clinical-based apps that are never going to touch the patient and are only for the physician. And 50% of their apps, they want to touch and they want to engage. And a big issue institutions like that are having is doctors want to bring their own device to work. So if we enable them to bring their own device, we want to be able to make sure when they have this app that it's secure and that we can take it back if that physician leaves. So the question goes, like, on the provider side, who's in control? You know, is it going to be the physician? Is it going to be the institution? And we truly believe when it's about patients, it should be the physician and the institution. Where's the government going to play in this? You know, you know people talk about pay for performance, meaningful use stage two, quality care. These are all reasons that physicians and institutions want to engage with their patients. But if you listen to just what's happening with the FDA right now, are they going to hold off getting involved in certifying certain apps to 2014, or are they going to get involved now? You know, where Haptic actually believes is we think it's a great thing either way. If the FDA decides that they're going to start certifying a certain subset of apps tomorrow, we think it's incredible. And if they wait to 2014, we think it's actually a good thing too. So what we see as Haptic is this very limited um, health app ca um, curation, categorization. There is not a lot of security around mobile apps that we're letting people bring your own device. Um, no one knows the quality of apps. Um, goes back to 250 glucose monitoring apps and so on. Providers, there's no real clear way for a provider to give an app to a patient. So traditionally, he can say, go to Google Play or go to iTunes, or here's a link, go here. And what we're trying to do is put all that together by enabling every institution to have their own private app store. So let's just say a Mount Sinai private store for internally, and then a patient engagement environment or store that has not only apps that we curated from the entire Android marketplace and the um, iOS app marketplace, 
but hospitals are creating their own formulary. And what we're hearing from hospitals after they curate them is that they're not going to allow their physicians to engage with patients with apps unless there's some element of certification. And basically what that means is, I actually was with Presbyterian Hospital earlier this week, and their president and CEO, blank statement was, hey, we really believe in prescribing apps, we really believe in getting apps in the patient's hands, but we're never going to allow our clinicians to provide an app to anyone unless it's been reviewed or looked at by other clinicians. So certification is really, really important. Um, Haptik is in the middle of doing a, an app certification, which I'll talk to in a second. And then the last thing is we want to be able to prescribe apps, and whether it's tied into an EMR or an EHR or standalone, to enable a physician with one click to prescribe an app, and if there is reimbursement, whether the reimbursement is coming from pharma, whether it's coming from a payer, whether it's apps that they've created themselves, it's about getting it in the hands and having that record. Did a physician prescribe an app to a patient? Did the patient download it? And then the longer term is, what were the outcomes from it? I mean, that's when it starts getting really excited. If, if I give you a tag-along app to a medication that I'm prescribing, are you more likely, if you're using it, if you download Pfizer's cholesterol app, are you more likely to keep on taking your Lipitor? Chances are yes, or why else would you download the app? You know, as I mentioned before, mobile app management, really important, knowing what you're giving them, being able to update it, be able to get the information back and forth. Um, last couple slides I'm going to show is, hey, curating and indexing. One thing that our company has done, and other companies are starting to do, is we've taken the whole marketplace, we took it from two categories, put it in several hundred categories, enable an institution to actually then recurate down to what they want their formulary for their patient facing. Um, our panel, we're about to launch next week our guidelines. We're meeting with the, on Monday, the FDA, the FTC, and the FCC to share our guidelines with them. And then middle of next week, we'll open up to the public for public scrutiny. And ideally, by the end of the summer, we'll be enabling app developers to submit their apps to get certified. And what I mean by certified, we're reviewing them for malware and security. We're reviewing them for what they're connected to. Like, are they connected to a TUNET? Or are they connected to what connected devices? Did the information come from credible sources, um, not from Wikipedia? And does the app do what it says it's going to do? We're partnered with the AMC and with the um, AMA. Um, and they will be supplying the app reviewers. And our goal is to sort of put a good housekeeping seal on it. Not rate it, not say, we think that should be physicians and patients should be the only ones rating apps. But we want at least the physician going back to the glucose sort of joke, about 250 of them out there. If a doctor sees one that's been reviewed and certified by other clinicians, are they more likely to use that app? And then also, our patients, if they're on their own, are they more likely to download something that has sort of an AMA, good housekeeping seal on it, than something that doesn't? And then the last two things I just wanted to talk about is our prescribing, our patent pending technology for prescribing is we really want to, and what you do in your EMR and ERX, we want to do an MRX. So just as you're going to prescribe medicine, if your patient is a smoker, prescribe him a smoke sensation app. Deliver it to him. Stay connected. It doesn't always have to be a connected app, but prescribe an app, deliver it to him. Know if he downloaded it. Remind him if he hasn't downloaded it, but stay connected. And where Haptique sort of plays in it, we sort of sit, look at ourselves sort of in the middle of the ecosystem. We're an enabler. We're betting on every app developer to win. Um, and we're betting on that providers. We know hospitals. We come from the hospital side. We know hospitals want to engage with their physicians. And we know physicians want to be engaging with the patients. And we know that the payers are going to eventually play a role in this. And we know to developers, if you're developing apps and you want to be in healthcare, just building it and not guaranteeing the audience that there's no malware, there's no security, and that it's been reviewed by clinicians is so important. Great. And so. <laughs> we're going to take questions. Any, um, otherwise, we're going to finish very early, and everybody can have a long coffee break. Any, any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. I think a microphone is coming. Hi, uh, I want to ask a question about the last point. Yeah. Uh, I, th I thought it was a fantastic idea to have uh, the guideline. So two parts to the question. First one, 
Is it going to be just a guideline, or is it going to be FDA clearance process that people, people have to go through? All right, so we believe, you know, eventually the FDA is going to probably be more about 20% of the apps that are out there. And then we're going to be, uh, we want to be approved by the FDA, but it's not going to be the FDA is going to say you have to go to an organization like Haptique. It's going to be more like, the concept is once it's out there and the guidelines are out there, if you're a developer and you're trying to get an app into a hospital formulary on apps or a physician's formulary, you're going to want to get it certified. You're going to want to get sort of that good housekeeping seal, sort of what the ADA used to do on toothpaste you're going to want to go through it. So we think we play really nicely with the FDA. One of the reasons why we're, we have a meeting with them on Monday is we want to share what we're doing. We want to get their, their blessing that they think, great, these are the good things you're looking for. Or, hey, maybe you should add these things as you're reviewing it. And our guidelines aren't just guidelines. An app developer actually submits it to us. We run it through malware and security testing. Then we give it to two clinicians in that specialty field. And those clinicians are going to review the material. And then we're also going to look up where that material came from, that it came from credible sources. And then we test the app to make sure it does what it says it does. So if it's a calculator, it calculates right. Or, and if it's a connected app, that it does what it says it's going to do. Okay. Uh, part two to, your, to the question is, uh, uh, I, I've seen apps like uh, on iPhone that they can use it to monitor the heart rate, the ECG signals. So my question is, this could be scary because uh, if uh, the doctor remotely used that data to make a decision and then end up with a problem, there will be liability involved. And so, so how does the app, uh, what kind of regulation do you think should be? My, my personal opinion, anything Correct. that turns your device into a, a medical device, right? So like, like an EKG, like Dr. Albert's product, that should go through the FDA, which, which it did, right? So if it's going to check my heart rate. But if it's the app that's reading the information from the device or the connected device, that's where an organization like ours should come in place, where we actually are making sure it does. The liability is not going to be there. You know, we spent a lot of time looking at where the liability is going to be. If there's liability, it's more about, you know, I give someone a blood pressure cuff, and that blood pressure cuff isn't working. You know, that's, that's a malfunction in the equipment. I just want to um, make a comment from a physician's point of view. I think it's a great question. You know, the, most physicians, the vast majority, will not uh, rely on that information and probably don't want it, to be honest, at least in the current scenario. Even with my adherence data that I accumulate on my server, the really the, the ultimate recipient of that would only be a physician involved in an ACO model. Right. where the pharmacist is probably managing medication and here's not the physician. So, um, But shouldn't it be part of the mix? Yeah. I mean, it's not, it, I, I wouldn't rely on it like, yep, it's the law, you run to the hospital or not, not but, but shouldn't it, it be should part be. of the mix? It should be, but I, I, I'm just speaking right. because I, I think having practiced for 25 years, I, I got a sense of what yeah. doctors want and what they don't want, and they're very, very liability conscious. Right. Um, for example, my, uh, my mom, who I referenced in my speech, was, um, was in the hospital a couple weeks ago. And um, while she was there, she got uh, an unnecessary echo while in the emergency room performed by the emergency room uh, technologist, who was not even an uh, ultrasound technologist. And uh, I, being a radiologist, I was kind of looking over her shoulder, and, uh, and I said, well, who's going to read this? And uh, he said, well, they're going to do another one tomorrow, a real, a real one tomorrow, and then we'll compare notes. <laughs> so uh, even in that setting, the emergency room physician who is going to bill for that ultrasound, ultimately, is not going to read because of the risk of liability until he gets that reading. That's right. probably but, one but of the problems. But wouldn't that health. same doctor, like pill jogger, yeah. wouldn't that be the ideal app and product to give a patient. I mean, there's, there's no legal about it. It's just, it's more about the adherence element yes. or helping in the quality of care yes. as opposed to... Absolutely. Yes. And Don made a, a good point. He said, uh, you know, unless the app gives the patient something that they can work on, okay, yep. instead of just telling the heart rate, you know, there's this, this fellow that's suing the um, makers of the implantable defibrillators because mm -hmm. he wants the data. And... Um, you know, what are you going to do with that data? Are you just going to ruminate over it and make yourself worried? But, you know, if there are use case scenarios 
for the, the heart device if you have a known arrhythmia right. and, and you, you think you need to catch it when it happens, that, then that's a really good use case scenario. The worried well are not, is not a good case scenario, I think. Any other questions? Yep. Yes, Excuse sir. Me. Yeah, right here. Uh, regarding uh, your pill jogger, uh, how do you plan to market it and to whom? And mm -hmm. what's your monetization model? Uh, thank you uh, for the question. You know, um, we're not trying to sell the app to the public. Uh, in fact, it's free on the App Store now. You can download it for iPhones and, and pads and, and, and use it, but you have to load your own medicine. Ultimately, our business strategy is to work with the entities that already have the populations. So um, we're in I, let me just say that we're in talks with a large retail entity that has a number of patients that would benefit by our platform uh, by virtue of the fact that we are performance-based. So they have, the, they have the users. We afford them a different opportunity to get more value out of those users. So if the users then, if they promote the app to their uh, patients that, work, that go to their pharmacies, and we capture an additional MTM, medication therapeutic management code, $35 to $45 because the patient isn't taking their medicine. If we say, hey, it's time for your vaccine, come, in, come on into X and our clinic will provide that. Uh, if you're above 65, you maybe need a uh, flu vaccine or pneumococcal vaccine, that sort of thing. We capture a small additional fee for, for having engaged that transaction and various other health functions. And we can get that up to about a, a buck in America that we don't want to be greedy where there's a 10 times of return for the, our partner. And in Europe, we're going for an, uh, one euro, assuming there's still going to be a euro, but uh, something like that. And uh, there's tremendous value again for everybody. So if we have millions of patients that they already have, then our cash flow is obviously very good for payers. Particularly in our transitional care platform, they would pay us an X amount. We're trying to get it way below $1,000, including the hardware. So we were approached actually by a Chinese, maybe I shouldn't say that, uh, uh, a hardware manufacturer that could provide us very low cost tablets for this kind of solution. And, if, and, and again, the value for a payer would be if we can prevent that readmission by actually engaging the person, uh, then we've saved money. And then for pharma, pharma. there's obvious benefits so that they uh, can sell more of their product. But research is one thing, as a physician, I'm really totally turned on to about this because there's never been this opportunity where you can have an N of one. Somebody is on a bunch of medicines and they, ha they have a mobile device that they can interact with. And we can track side effects for a single medicine. Or we can say, oh wow, this medicine and this medicine because of the effect on the liver is gonna raise the half-life or whatever. But nobody's really been able to do it on a grand scale with all the different medicines that people are on. Because we can write algorithms and say, okay, if you're on these, this combination here and this combination here, look at, you know, is it making better, is it making worse? Because we can build in tap to answer functionality. Okay, are, are you tired today, or are your legs swelling? There are various side effects that, you know, when you see the ad on TV for this lifestyle product or not, and there's 20 different, you know, side effects that they have to list because of the FDA. Well, we can accumulate that data and really do something meaningful. So that has value, too. So that's our business model. We, so if you're long tails, you're going to get some clinical outcomes out of this. I, I, I think so. I expect so. I do. I, and that's obviously, cool. the question was asked about FDA. Once we get into that kind of data, certainly will be, uh, if not class one, class two device. Right. But um, I, I'm hopeful that we can, we have a good monetization strategy. Any other questions? Yes. Good morning. Um, so it's my understanding that your company is going to work with the FDA to certify apps in health. Uh, my question is, or I guess you also mentioned that um, you're essentially going to determine whether or not the app does what it says it's going to do. Uh, my question is, what about clinical relevance? Are you uh, going to test for that? No. Well? So it's a great question. Actually, we have a weekly radio show called M Health Zone, and, ne and next Thursday at noon Eastern, we have the guys from Johns Hopkins who are doing a lot of the ethnicity, right? So the problem is if you're gonna go down that road of ethnicity, which we don't wanna go down as an organization, but if you go down, that's a long road. You can't, you know, you can't review that in 30 days. You know, if a developer comes to us and goes, hey, I wanna get certified, you can't say, hey, we're gonna get back to you in nine months after we do the ethnicity of it and we've really figured out and we do it in a subset of group. We're really, we're reviewing the app that it does what it says it does. The information came from the right place and that if a patient downloads it, we're not gonna break any HIPAA compliance. It connects if it's supposed to connect. There's no malware, there's no security issues on it. To get into that, we think that should be, you know, 
the Johns Hopkins of the world, the Mayo Clinics of the world, though the, a lot of the pharma companies, they will do the ethnicity of, of, of apps. But as us as an organization, we don't want to get involved in that. We want to stay sort of agnostic when it comes to that for all apps. Yeah, Dan Monroe with Forbes. So hey, this is really for uh, Pill Jogger. I'm particularly interested, maybe I missed the beginning of this, but particularly interested in um, results on medication adherence because medication adherence is a huge, huge mm -hmm. issue. Yep. And it, it's multifaceted in the sense mm -hmm. of cost and behavior. Mm -hmm. um, Lipitor is a great example. Mm -hmm. I think the I think the medication adherence falls off to 50% mm -hmm. within six months. And, and so capturing that is a key element. So yeah. what are the statistics that you're seeing relative to medication adherence, yeah. first part? Second part, uh, I don't know if you saw it yesterday, but from Rock Health, did you see MedMonk? Mm -hmm. and, and what's the overlap there relative to what you're doing in sort of the same space? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed MedMonk uh, yesterday. Uh, so I'm interested to find out about it. I, I had a conflict, but um, couponing. I'll, I'll look into it. Uh, thanks for pointing that out. As far as our record, we, we just went live on April 13th with our application. So we have no data to show effic efficacy or anything else. We're working with uh, Smart Design to actually build a production ready med wheel. And we've talked to various uh, large entities that uh, can and are interested in working with us both here and on the European continent to produce these at a very cost-effective rate. I think we can only get efficacy if we match the two. So we, we call it maybe bombastically the um, each dose program. So each is ever, uh, easy, okay, so people don't have to mess with their pill bottles. It's all loaded for them in a single cartridge every day. Affordable because we do this on a grand scale. Uh, pr producing you know, tens of thousands an hour for various people, which we go from a central facility. Convenience, so it's always with you because people have their phones now with them at all times, and H is helpful. Those were sort of the things that I was talking about, the ec economic benefit of participating. So when you get a reminder, it's not like, why did I sign up for this? But there's something that is actually of use to you when, when that experience happens. So I think by combining those two, I'm very hopeful that we can really solve that problem. We'll see. Time will, uh, time will tell. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Jill? Thank you. Thank you, Jill.